Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life, whereunto thou art also summoned, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee this charge in the sight of God, who makes all things alive, and before Christ Jesus, who in the presence of Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Keep this command without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who only possesses immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to him honor and power everlasting. Amen. Notice something here? Linked with holiness as a byproduct is fighting the good fight of faith. In other words, the brother who was up here before me was talking about spiritual warfare. There can be no holiness without spiritual war. You think God is going to give you the fruits of holiness by osmosis? Do you think that after others have sailed through bloody seas, unbelievable conflicts, great controversy, persecution, suffering, even unto death, that you can manifest the holiness of God in your life without conflict? That's madness. And that's what too many Christians are trying to get today. They're trying to get holiness as if you could buy it at Kmart. They're trying to get holiness by running off the deeper life conferences. They're trying to get holiness by going to hear this evangelist or that evangelist or this TV uh, uh, speaker or this Bible teacher. They're trying to get it. For God's sake, don't try and get holiness from Walter Martin because Walter Martin's holiness is borrowed from Jesus Christ. I'm not here for that purpose. I'm here to draw our attention to the basic bottom line of what it all means. And the bottom line is that you've got to translate the word holiness and sanctification and godliness into its basic meaning, God-likeness. To be like Him. To see Him as He is. That's the joy of the Christian. That's the goal of the Christian. Looking for that blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of the great God and of our Savior Jesus Christ, who shall transform these bodies which humiliate us, so that they shall become like unto his own glorious body through that power whereby he is able to subdue everything unto himself. So, the good fight of faith is a byproduct of Christ living in you. There is such a thing as spiritual war. And there is such a thing as righteous indignation and godly anger. It is right to be angry in the presence of evil. I will repeat that. It is right in the sight of God to be angry in the presence of evil. I am one of God's last angry men. And I get in trouble more often than anybody else. And the Bible Answer Man program indicates that where I'm often sworn at on the air for doing nothing other than telling them the truth. They get mad. But the ministry is not a popularity contest. The Christian life is not a popularity contest. You're not here to be popular. You're here to serve. If God happens to give you the love of others and popularity along with it, consider yourself extremely fortunate. But it's not necessary. You can live without it. Now, this spiritual warfare takes place in the life of the believer when the believer is provoked by evil. You read Acts chapter 17, you'll find that when Paul was in Athens waiting for his cohorts, he was provoked by the idolatry which he saw all around him. Remember? When he saw the whole city given over to idolatry, his spirit was provoked. He became angry. They went down and stood in the marketplace by the temple of Vulcan, where I have stood today. 
Still there. Right where he was. And boy, he chewed the Athenians out from top to bottom. It only took him very long to do it. By the time he got finished, he had people getting saved. Right up on the judgment throne under the Acropolis. They were coming to Christ. Why? Because he told it like it was. Do you know what the Christian church needs today? It needs men with the guts to tell it like it is. Some people think that in order to be a Christian, you have to be a simpering, semi-tubercular, physical wreck. Or you can never use any strong language that's going to describe the truth, because if you do, people are going to be offended. Read my lips. I was passing through an airport one time, and as I went through, I looked over, and Muhammad Ali was sitting there. And I said, ah, an opportunity. <laughs> so I walked over to him, and I said, uh, Mr. Ali? He said, yes. I said, I don't want your autograph, and I'm not here to bother you. I'm not a celebrity hound. And he laughed. And I said, we have a mutual friend. He said, who is that? I said, Rocky Marciano. I said, he was a personal friend of mine for many years. He said, you knew Rocky? I said, very well. I said, he told me all about his computer fight with you and all the rest of the things that you did. He said, yes. He said, we had a terrific time. He says, we only use body punches. And he said, uh, we fought one-minute rounds. I said, well, what did you think of him? He said, well, I thought, talk about something Ali wanted to talk about, which is fighting. And then when his guard is down, sock it to him. <laughs> So I'm a, bo a boxing enthusiast who boxed myself So and wrestled, so I was interested. And I recounted the fight to him and the different fights that he'd had and so forth. He said, yes, yes. I said, what did you think of Marciano? I said, I understand that he was the hardest puncher ever recorded in the history of boxing. He could take you out with a left hand or a right hand and never had to travel more than six inches. All he had to do was get one clean shot at you. He says, it's true. He says, we only hit each other from the shoulders down. He says, that man hit so hard with 16-inch gloves on. Not standard gloves, 16-inch gloves. He said, he hit so hard with 16-inch gloves that my arms were paralyzed and my ribs were bruised for six weeks. He said, if he had had on standard gloves and he could have got a shot at me, he said, woo ee He said, I was on the bicycle and moving away as fast as I could. He said, hit so hard, he says, it was like getting hit with a fistful of rocks. He says, they called him Rocky rightly. So we talked a few minutes more, and he had a little book there, a Mohammedan book, an Islamic book. And he said to me, uh, I've been reading this stuff here. Uh, he says, you believe in hell? Man's terrified of hell because he knows he's going there. And I said to him, well... Ali, I said, the greatest man that ever lived, Jesus Christ, said it was he said there was a hell, and he preached on it more times than he ever preached on heaven. He said, no. I said, yes, and Jesus always told the truth. He said, yeah. <laughs> I says, there is a hell. And I had a chance to witness to him. But nevertheless, he was attracted in our conversation, first by the material our mutual interest, and then the spiritual. I had my cross on. People say, why do you wear such a big cross? Just for that reason. It attracts attention. And secondly, I found out devils don't like it, and what they don't like, I wear. <laughs> you see, I'm a ghetto kid. I came out of the Bedford-Stuyvesant ghetto. You black guys were my neighbors. I grew up with you. Blacks, Italians, and Puerto Ricans. And I grew up in the neighborhood where you fought to get to school, you fought while you were at school, and you fought to come back from school. You remember? I remember when you had a little tire chain in your pocket, too, that you wrapped around your hand, see, so that if you did have to hit somebody, you made sure that you hit them and got away. You also learn how to use garbage can lids to keep people with knives away from you. 
I also learned to walk in the middle of the street when it got past dark because somebody come out of an alley and cut your ever living throat. I could tell you all the things you already know. There's only two kinds of people that come out of the ghetto, baby, the quick and the dead. If you're not quick, you are dead. I am a survivor. You mark that down. So talking to our friend Rocky Marciano was fun. He came out of the same thing. Talking to Ali was fun. He understood what I was talking about. But first, the physical, says Paul, that which is natural. Then the spiritual. The confrontation with the person of Christ. What was it that shook up Muhammad Ali? It was the fact that he was encountering the truth of Jesus Christ right there. And he was seeing Christ in me. I know that's true. I know because others have told me exactly the same thing. And I'm not alone. Every single time you open your mouth and you can't remember what you're saying afterwards, it's God, the Holy Spirit, that's confronting those people. He's bringing them the conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment. And there is such a thing as righteous indignation. I said it before. I want to say it again. If you don't become indignant in the presence of evil, there is something wrong with your godlikeness. If you can sit still in the middle of pornography, filthy language, depravity, if you can sit still in the midst of people mocking Christ or Christianity, you can sit still and never say anything, I challenge very much whether the image of God lives in you. Because he that is born of God does not practice sin as a habit. He not only knows God, but his seed remains within him. And it's going to come out in his life and in his witness. So when I turn on my television set and I see false doctrine coming out on Christian radio and television programs, I become righteously indignant. When I hear Kenneth Copeland say, dogs beget dogs and cats beget cats and God begets gods, uh, that makes me mad because we are not gods. We will never be gods. He says Jesus Christ told him that when Jesus was on earth, he never claimed to be God. He only claimed to walk with God. Really? What did Jesus say in John chapter 8? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day coming. He saw it. He was glad. They said, you're not even 50 years old yet. You have seen Abraham. Jesus said, I tell you, before Abraham sprang into existence, I am the eternal God. So there is such a thing as spiritual warfare. And I want to close with this emphasis because it fits in with the life of holiness. Those that are holy will sanctify the Lord God in their hearts. They will give to people that ask them a reason for the hope that lies within them. They will fight the good fight of faith. They will lay hold on eternal life. They will not sit still or be silent in the presence of evil. The bottom line of holiness is action in obedience to the power of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we are told that we are at spiritual conflict. The weapons of our warfare are not, what? Carnal, but mighty from God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? To the demolishing of arguments and every proud thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's war. And taking into captivity every thought to the person of Jesus Christ. In the words of a great old hymn, I close. We don't sing it much anymore. We sing a lot of choruses. We sing a lot of music which unfortunately sounds so much alike that only the words change and the music stays the same. I'm a little tired of that. I'd like to go back to some of the great old hymns of the church. And I'll close with one of them. Rise up, O men of God have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and strength and mind and serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God, the church for you doth wait, her strength unequal to her task. Rise up and make her great. He that has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says of the church. Obey him. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen.
that has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the church. Obey Him. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen.